a co-founder of Australia's first organic certifier, NASA, or the National Accreditation for Association. Sustainable Agriculture. Why is there two S's in there? Anyway, in 1986, the first organic guarantee systems coordinator for the World Peak Body and Organics, I'm not even going to go to iPhone, uh, in 2001, and the main author of numerous certification standards and guidebooks, some of which are here today, including dung beetles down under. Love it. <clears throat> um, a leader in organic agriculture and certification in Australia for 45 years and a significant contributor to organic standards. Tim Marshall is joining us today. Now, over his time serving his country and his expertise, field of expertise, I should say, he's visited more than 5,000 organic farms. Well, I don't have time to visit three. So, you know, this is great. Now, they're um, all farms in conversion to organic. Now, organic can often be confused with certification processes and standards that my microphone doesn't have uh, cutting in and out. So, without any further ado, and because this microphone's ticking me off, um, I now call on Tim Marshall to regale you with his tales firsthand. Thank you. Got a lot to say, so let me know if I'm speaking too fast. I'll try to stick with the ABC XYZ approach to public speaking, if you're familiar with that. ABC, always be concise. XYZ, examine your zipper. <laughs> right. So, uh, this is me. Uh, so, Compost nut, uh, organic writer, chair of uh, NASA, which was the first organic certifier in the Southern Hemisphere. Still remains the largest organic certifier in the world by, uh, by land area that we certify. So uh, I guess a lot of our beef properties west of here and right over uh, continuing over into Western Australia are responsible for a lot of that. Uh, and. Uh, another one of my books, which some of you I know are familiar with. So, um, started like a lot of people in uh, in horticulture in local government. Ended up uh, qu quite soon teaching in TAFE. Got involved with some very large revegetation projects. My first, I guess, uh, appointment in in agriculture was a CSIRO um, multifactorial trace element trial on the Eyre Peninsula. And that's when I started to ask uh, a number of questions about uh, it was the food we're producing healthy, uh, was the agriculture sustainable, and um, why was conservation always on the other side of the fence? So in those days, I guess, conservation was something you did on the bush block on the other side of the fence. And I was asking about how do, how do you bring those you know, useful conservation activities into the paddock? So working on the Air Peninsula and possibly uh, alkaline soils, uh, low rainfall, serious trace element deficiency, massive tree clearance. Um, so, you know, will that sort of agriculture ever be sustainable? And then I also started to engage with alternative approaches like the idea of, of analogue uh, agriculture. In other words, agriculture that looked like the, that country used to look like before uh, 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 Western people came along. So, you know, what should it be tree-based, for instance, rather than cereals? And I suspect that cereal cropping will never be sustainable on that country. Uh, dealing with what was in those days the myth of uh, bare soil fallow um, and superphosphate dependency. So I got involved with uh, the concept of sustainability, which was a bit of like the zeitgeist at the moment in the way that re regeneration... Uh, is now. Um, got involved with developing organic standards and it developed quite quickly. Uh, so we soon established um, those standards and the certification protocols and NASA became a worldwide market leader in, in writing standards and delivering certification. 
and uh, very much also it impressed me that it was on farm and farmer focused. Well, it had to be because there was no research, there was no extension, et cetera, of any sort whatsoever. And then the sustainable word, which I still defend, and a lot of people are saying sustainable is not a good term these days because it speaks to them of, spe of being static. But look at this diagram here and you'll see why I think that it's got a lot to offer. Uh, everyone understood the idea of uh, economic uh, sustainability, but we had to introduce into that debate the idea of environmental and social sustainability as well to uh, create the sort of society that we wanted and the sort of agriculture that we wanted. <coughs> we realised that there were three steps that people would take towards the sustainability goal. And the first stage was adjusting the system. So there people were trying to reduce their chemical dependency, they were experimenting with things like integrated pest management for instance, uh, tr trying to develop things like uh, conservation tillage and uh, conservation banks and those sorts of things and land care, you know, putting some trees back into the landscape. As people progressed a little bit down the sustainability track, they started asking what we call the substitution questions. What do I use instead of urea? What do I use instead of Roundup? What do I use instead of superphosphate? But as people progressed further down the line, they started to ask different sorts of questions, which were about how to redesign the landscape. And that's why where we talk about agroecology, we talk about regenerative permaculture, etc. In other words, trying to remove the disruptive inputs altogether and build the, the defence against those sorts of pest and fertility management problems into the system itself. So uh, now we hear a lot about regenerative. So uh, they've put up some definitions there and uh, really just to point out that, there, that we don't yet have a proper definition of uh, regenerative. You know, we've got definitions of organic and that lad largely in the form of a 90 page long standard. But here's a few quotes here. Uh, regenerative agriculture is a system promoting nature based solutions to improve soil and landscape health and productivity while pr improving water and nutrient retention. Or it did, uh, regenerative agriculture differs from organic in that it does not prohibit the use of chemical inputs within a farming system while at the same time suggesting constraints be applied where synthetic chemicals are used. And the last one there, um, aim to regenerate the natural functions of soil and landscape, increasing biodiversity through implementation of a range of regenerative practices and reduction of chemical inputs. So this term, regenerative, was actually developed by Robert Rodale from the f famous Rodale organic family in the, uh, in the United States. And uh, he, he, he mentioned these seven tendencies towards uh, regenerative. So pluralism, we can understand that to be diversity and diversity of plants, for instance, in the landscape. But he also talked, uh, in each of these seven steps, he talked about the, uh, the social and cultural approach as well. So diversity of opportunities for people moving forward. Protection, soil cover, I guess, he largely meant by that. Purity, it's about removing chemicals from the system. Permanence, permanent um, plants in the landscape, but also about the permanence of businesses and farm businesses in particular. I guess the idea of peace was largely about removing this concept of a war against weeds and looking at a different way of uh, relating to your weeds. Potential for the future for growth and progress in terms of improving our, our soils into the future, but also improving uh, you know, the, the, our, our society into the, into the future. These days, we focus on regenerative ag agriculture a little bit more on these four main practices, uh, reducing tillage or avoiding tillage altogether, restraining, uh, restoring soil and the plant microbiome, uh, building ecosystem diversity and managing grazing well. So, both organic and regenerative have very similar goals with respect to improving soil quality bio and biodiversity while maintaining a focus on production. Regenerative does not necessarily exclude synthetic chemicals. Organic does exclude synthetic chemicals. 
I guess the question I ask is, how do you get to be really regenerative if you rely on inputs that are degenerative? But I think that done well, organic is regenerative and that done well, regenerative is organic. There is a continuing dispute in the regenerative movement about whether we need certification or whether regenerative should it develop its own certification. There are at least three regenerative certification programs under development and that might be four. I do think that if you're going to go organic, that one of the things you really need to begin to understand is how nitrogen works in your system. We have increased production tr tremendously with industrial nitrogen production. But we've done that at the cost of destroying carbon or organic matter, a beautification of oceans and streams and contributing to climate change and increasing pathogens. And I'll explain a little bit more of that as we go along. And that stands against the natural or biological, or I like to use the word agroecological processes, where we use the information contained in the DNA to produce biological nitrogen. Uh, and here I'll introduce a, a French professor called Chibuso. And there's a little quote there from William Albrecht who says, insects and diseases are the symptoms of a failing crop, not the cause of it. It's not the overpowering invader we must fear, but the weakened condition of the victim. So Shibuso, what Shibuso did was show us how, de how destructive nitrogen, excess nitrogen can be in the plant. So... Uh, the ideal in an organic system is that every day on which it's warm enough for the crop to grow, the soil processes enough of nitrogen out of organic matter to get into the plant for basically that day's growth. Every extra bit of nitrogen that we put into the sap stream of the plant, if we put a lot of urea or some other form of synthetic nitrogen on the plant and fill up that sap stream with nitrogen that the plant is unable to use. So that is the opportunity for fungi and for pests to um, access that nitrogen for their growth purposes. So we know that, for instance, if we use too much nitrogen and we get long and sappy growth, it's easy for the sucking pests to stick their little proboscis into the plant and start to suck out nitrogen, which is what they need. Now, they have a different biology to you and I. We can eat a steak and break down the steak into the constituent amino acids and then reform those amino acids in our body into the proteins that our body needs today, right? Those sucking pests can't do that. They can't utilise whole proteins. They need to find a plant that has uh, free-form amino acids in the sap stream. So that's what we're doing when we overuse nitrogen. We're actually creating exactly the right conditions for the rapid growth of the sucking pests and also for the growth of um, fungi. So understanding that you need to try as hard as you can to, and it's not necessarily easy, but to develop your organic systems to the point where they are just ticking over and producing the nitrogen that you need for today's growth. This is what we're aiming for, a really healthy soil. So you can see what makes this soil healthy. You can see the air holes, you can see the fracture lines, you can see evidence of good biology. We can't smell this, but you can imagine the smell. It would be uh, he healthy and earthy with no off smells whatsoever. And importantly, those white hair roots without any brown marks or lesions. That's what we're looking to do. So I became best known first up for my work in compost. And my first book was on compost. It's been 
reprinted twice and probably sold more copies than any other book on compost in Australia. Um, and I think we understand the benefits of compost, so I'm not going to read this list, but compost and organic matter in your soils can do uh, a lot to increase your uh, water absorption, deal with toxins in, in the soil, um, in, uh, in, uh, many, many things that compost can and organic matter can do. But after about 2010, when I was doing a lot of public speaking, people began to react to me saying, you know, compost and organic matter is not the goal, right? It's the tool. It's not the goal, it's the tool. The goal is actually to grow healthy plant roots, right? That's what you're really aiming for. So uh, the most economical and effective way to increase soil carbon is to grow it. And we talk about this thing which we call the carbon gift, you know. We used to think that in the orchard, in the garden, in the paddock, we could not have any plants that weren't crop plants. And now we understand that just growing anything green to get soil cover is really useful because that's where nutrition comes from. 95% of your crop plant came from air and water. Only between 3 and 5% of your crop ever came from the soil. Okay? So carbon, hydrogen and oxygen that make up 95 to 98% of the plant came from the atmosphere and water. And in fact, if you have good ground cover, it's likely that 30% of the sugars produced by that plant actually get pushed back into the soil. And when we first discovered that, there was the feeling that this had to be a waste elimination process by the plant. It's nothing to do with that. This is the plant not being passively just sitting in the soil but actively engaging with the soil pushing the sugars that it's made out into the plant to feed the bacteria and the fungi and the other biology that's an immediate association with that root what we call the rhizosphere so that that those bacteria that biology then releases the the nutrients that 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 the plant needs. So this is beginning to understand what we call the rhizosphere, that ecosystem that exists between the plant and the soil. And so what we have to do is try and increase the amount of plant cover, assuring, ensuring only that the crop plant has the premium access to sunlight and water. So we want to grow uh, roots as much as we, as healthy as we can and as deep as we can and as quickly as we can. Um, and, uh, and, and I encourage you to, um, to observe your soil as much as possible and to observe the growth of your soil as much as possible. Very few people realise how big a root system really wants to be. This is a picture from a very famous book about root development by a fellow called John Weaver. It's a really interesting book to have a look at. So this particular one that I've chosen is a root system of a garden uh, beet that's three and a half months old. And if you have a look, oops, each of those divisions, that's a f a f 12 inches in the old money, a foot. So there we have a root system from a garden beet that's been there for three and a half months. It's two metres wide and it's two and a half metres deep. And if that was a really good, well-developed broccoli with a head that big, that could be four and a half metres deep and three metres wide. So when I started messing in agriculture, the vineyards and the orchards in the Adelaide Hills, where I lived, largely looked like that. And people thought that was what they should look like. 
and about the time that I was getting involved in agriculture, we learnt to grow uh, crops uh, between the rows, often alternating rows of grasses and legumes, which we would swap over in alternate years. Um, and then we would remove them, plough them in, as you see happening here, at the beginning of the growth season for the crop so that they didn't provide any competition to the crop plant. After a while, we learnt that we could... We didn't have to remove all of those cover crops. We could leave the mid-row. And so we used tools like this Clemens dodging plough to actually remove the vegetation right under the canopy of the plant where we thought it was going to be providing competition and we could leave the mid-row there without doing any harm. And of course also about that time Roundup came in. Now there had been herbicides before but everyone thought this Roundup product was going to be absolutely fantastic and safe to use and so you have the development of this. So this is taken from an apple orchard close to where I live in the Adelaide Hills. I currently live at the moment between the Adelaide Hills and Townsville, by the way. So this, uh, this apple row here would have been herbicided for 40 years. If you want to dig a hole under that tree, you need a mattock or a crowbar. Okay. Just turning around, and you can just go back to that picture, you can see that um, that's the end of the row and I'm stood on the bitumen actually, and if I turn around and look the other way, that's the organic orchard on the other side. All right? That's a pretty contrast difference. Now I can get down underneath that tree on my hands and knees and dig a hole with my hand. In fact, that orchard for much of the year looks like this. And I know that a lot of the neighbours there look in there and think, Look at one of those lazy organic farmers, got weeds everywhere, which of course is a really great misunderstanding of this system because what you see there, those yellow flowers, are the pest control system for this orchard, right? So this guy's really clever. What he's done is he's put some plants in that ground cover that are actually more attractive to a light brown apple moth than an apple tree is, right? So he's moved some of those plants uh, um, apple moth out of the tree and down into the ground cover. He's then put a lot of flowering plants, and especially those white and yellow flowering plants in particular, because they're attractive to the predators, to, to the wasps, to the hoverflies, to the various things that, um, that are going to predate upon the light brown apple moth and the various other pests of apple trees. Interestingly, almost all of the pests can survive just within the canopy of the tree. Almost all of the beneficial insects need a diversified environment. They have a different place where they hunt, where they rest, where they uh, multiply or create another generation and where they feed. Because they hunt in the canopy, but they don't feed in the canopy, right? They're feeding on the nectar and pollen that comes from those yellow flowers. And then they fly up into the tree to find, uh, you know, a caterpillar to predate, and that's where they lay their eggs. And it's not the wasp that eats the, the caterpillar, it's the larva that comes out of the egg. Just another picture. This is a very famous vineyard. Uh, this is the vineyard where um, Richard Smart developed something called the Smart Dyson Trellis. So just another picture of a biodynamic vineyard from Cassegrain. This is one of my favourite vineyards. This is Random Valley in Western Australia. This is not a sown ground cover. This is an entirely native ground cover, indigenous to this area. Its main growing period is in spring and in autumn. It doesn't grow in summer. That's actually a rare and endangered species which features on the label of the, uh, the wines produced in this. And this is completely unmown. 
The only mowing that's done here is there's a little bit of a track mowing down here for the harvest vehicles to move up and down. So that's a f what a fantastic opportunity. Time's moving along, so I'm going to move quickly. These are just some pictures of some diversified organic plantings that I'm showing you. This is also a favourite picture of mine. This is an uh, organic brassica crop in the mid-north of South Australia. And I can just imagine all the cocky farmers driving out of this town past this, past this crop and looking in and thinking, that's another one of those crazy, lazy, weedy, organic farmers, which again is a really big misunderstanding of what's going on. This is a highly designed pest control system. So the brassicas in, in this uh, uh, paddock, that they're full of sulphur. So when you cook a cabbage or any other brassica and you get that s you know, cabbage smell coming off of the plant, that's sulphur being released from, uh, from these brassicas. In between these uh, broccoli is planted mustard. So mustard is the same family. It just happens to have nine times more sulphur than the brassica has, than the, the broccoli has. So how does the wasp that's hunting for the caterpillar of the black diamond moth know how to, where to lay its eggs, okay? How does it know that it has taste buds in its feet, okay? How many, how many uh, senses do you reckon we have? I reckon we've got at least 20. It might be 30, okay? So, you know, taste, it's actually, it's, it's, uh, it's salt, it's sour, it's sweet, it's umami, you know. Uh, touch, that's pressure sensation, texture sensation, temperature sensation, etc. right? When you deal with insects, they mess all those senses together. Those antennas are doing all sorts of things that we don't understand as, as, as coming from a single sense. And to, to, to know that this is a good place to lay my egg, the, uh, the, w the wasp has its taste sensations here. Now, it hap happens that this broccoli is going to take probably 12 and 13 weeks to start to flower. And the mustard flowers in eight weeks. So first thing you've done, you've used a crop, a trap plant. You've moved most of your pests from the crop plant into the mustard. And then the mustard produces these wonderful yellow flowers that attract, attract uh, the wasps. And there's also a whole lot of other yellow flower plants that are put in here. So this is only under, can only be understood as a highly designed and well thought out pest control system. It looks like a weedy paddock. It's something else altogether. <coughs> so um, why did I call my main gardening book The New Organic Gardener? Because nobody likes the old literature of more than me. I've probably got the biggest collection of old literature on organic in Australia. I love all that old literature. But then I look at the new books and everybody's looking back and they're copying the old stuff. They're not looking forward to what we've got now. You know, the compost books say you can't compost coloured paper, right? Because, you know, cobalt yellow, uh, cobalt blue used to be made from cobalt and cadmium yellow used to be made from cadmium, etc. all of those things. In the 1960s and 70s, that became a major occupational health and safety issue for printers. Almost all inks now are made from soy and they're edible. Okay, so why did it take us 40 or 50 years? And we still, a lot of books still haven't changed that. So all I'm saying here is look around at the new technology and the new science. It's making organic production a lot easier. Look at this beautiful mowing tool here. It's going down and mowing the mid row and both sides of the vineyard and it's got these wonderful dodging ploughs on both sides and they'll also go up and down. So even if you've got mounding around your, around your rows, this tree can handle it. 
robotics is going to bring to organic the most fantastic opportunities. Now, I was talking to Kim, I think it was last night, and saying uh, one of the latest things I've heard of in development at the moment, it's a drone that will fly into your apple tree. It will actually pick up a, a pest. It will, you know, you just plug a picture of whatever pest you're trying to control and it will hover there in the tree and it will blow that insect pest apart with a high-powered water jet. Okay, so that far from the drone, you blast the locust to smithereens. That far on the other side of the locust, you have water vapour. We have wonderful new tools and technology such as the organic herbicides that are coming our way. So, talking fast now to finish, what are we going to do? Uh, just uh, observe as much as possible. Look at where this root is going from that tomato plant. If you've protected the soil, if you've not walked and driven over that soil, if you've given a bit of a mulch cover, which you can see pulled back, look where that root is going. Uh, so, examine your soils as much as possible. Um, here's the pictures of the crimped roller, which we begin to know about. The, the one on the tractor there, that's a, a forward-mounted roller. It has to be forward-mounted because if you drive over that vegetation, the wheels would lay it down and the crimp wouldn't work. So here, you're crimping down this vetch-dominant mixed pasture and the crimps kill, crush the phloem tubes. So if you do this near the end of the season for that growth, it's not going to grow again. It's going to lie down and think, I'm dead. And this particular tool here, you're actually dragging behind just a little uh, uh, corrugated uh, roller that's opening the soil and an injection planter that's planting straight into the mulch, all in one action. That small crimper on the right-hand side was built by, from scrap metal and $4 worth of uh, welding gas. The vineyard that comes from has rose grass this tall. You can't see the vines. And again, I'm sure everybody who looks in thinks, that's crazy. How can that farmer deal with that? But when that's a, a mid-mounted side uh, roller, you just push it to the ground and drive forward. It's not a driven tool. You're not using energy. As you drive forward, the crimps catch and roll over. And again, they crimp that rose grass, which lies on the ground. Now, if you were mulching that rose, uh, that rose grass, you'd be using a lot more energy to drive the, the tool, but also you would chop it into bits and it would break down faster. But when you just lie it down on the ground, it's going to stay there for the whole season and be a mulch for that crop for the whole summer. And here's the picture of the seedlings emerging from that dead vetch. And here we are with um, the, living, the living mulch. So we, one of the reasons that organic was successful 40 years ago when everyone thought we were going to go broke, we had the weeds. Because we had the weeds, we had the plant obligate mycorrhiza, which was just sitting there waiting for the growth season of the crop plant and ready to grow. Okay, You can buy these things in a packet now, but if we actually had vegetation in your orchard or in your vineyard, you had these things there sitting there waiting for the beginning of the season. I don't have time to talk about um, the rest of these slides. I'll just slash through them very, very quickly. This is a really high-tech um, thermal uh, weed control. So th this, is, this is the most high-tech tool that I've seen so far. And uh, yeah, when you drive, you're not destroying any organic matter here. Once this machine, this machine stopped here, and that's been tre heat treated, okay? You can't see the difference. If you got down on your hands and knees, it might be slightly yellow. But what you've done is you've caused this water in the cells to expand and rupture the cells, right? So this, and, and some of the proteins in that cell have coagulated, right? So two weeks' time or ten days' time, that grass is going to be completely dead. But it's still in place. You have not removed any organic matter and it actually takes less energy 
to apply the heat than it does to pull a cultivation tool through the soil. Just a Victorian tool called a weed fix. It stirs this way, if you like a Rotera, if you know what a Rotera does, not this way. So it's not destructive, it's not compounding, pounding your soil, it's not creating hard pan underneath and it's guarded. So those guards are going to protect a, a row crop. Just a couple of pictures to finish. This is a banana plantation, biodynamic banana plantation. This is Peter Watson's bananas. Um, just the idea of bringing... Oh, must be a time delay on that one. The idea of bringing uh, animals into, uh, into the property. This is uh, designed for the tropics. Normally the egg boxes on something like this would be on the outside, but you can see there's plenty of room for air movement all around here. There's the egg boxes. That's the water supply. And to harvest the eggs from up there, you step up into that and you turn the winder and all the eggs have come from the egg boxes down onto that continuous belt and you just wind the belt and they come to you. So just a couple of permaculture-inspired pictures to finish with. That's a, a southern operation with chickens and you can see there the egg boxes are down below. We've got organic aquaculture now, um, an organic golf course. And permaculture inspired farm that's um, Food Forest, probably our most famous permaculture inspired farm at Gawler, just north of Adelaide. Mangali, most of you will know that product. Uh, oh, I'd, I must take just one last minute to talk about this picture. Absolutely fantastic arrangement. This guy has grows. Cr Carrots in a region where carrot nematode is a major problem. So how's he going to get rid of it? Okay. Harvest the carrots, put a single electric wire and pigs. Just little squealers. Okay. So the pigs go nose first through everything so they don't like the electric wire. They'll dig out all, all, all the, the remnants of the, uh, of the carrot crop. And then on the carry all of the tractor, out comes these hoops. They just clip together simply and the chickens go in there to finish scratching in that soil. So you've done your primary cultivation, you've got rid of your pest and the next thing that goes on there, that gets removed. The, plant gets, the, the crop gets planted. There's plenty of space here, so there's a lot of space between the rows. The next thing that goes in is guinea pigs, okay? Now, you can't put a guinea pig on a zucchini plant that tall because it'll eat it. By the time the zucchini plant gets that tall, if you picked your zucchinis and you know that they're hairy and they're prickly and the, the, the guinea pig goes in nose first, it doesn't like it, okay? But by the time the the that crop plant is this tall, the guinea pig is completely healthy, happy underneath because its main predator is avian. It's hiding from birds and hawks. And there's a long distance here between this row and wherever the next row over is there. So if you've got a little cage here with the guinea pigs in it and you want the guinea pig to go over to the next row, you just get some plastic conduits and put them together and the guinea pig goes into the conduit and goes straight through the other end and it comes out the other end. And those guinea pigs get sold to the Perth Zoo to feed um, animals. So, yeah, yeah. So, uh, just, I love physical methods of weed control. This is Dacron. It's basically sticky. So ma ma major pest of olives is a weevil. Weevils can't get past this. I think it's just a wonderful system. And I like to finish with this slide. So uh, unfortunately, uh, this guy here is probably battling water at the moment because those river red gums there have their roots in the Darling River at Tilpa. So um, he's probably fishing from his veranda right now. 
if I know this bloke. So he's grown um, uh, some of the uh, organic cotton that produced, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry um, organic wool in this case, that's produced this fibre. This guy is uh, the wool buyer and he's now become an organic farmer himself. This guy runs the only first stage wool processing establishment left in Australia at, uh, in, in central New South Wales. This is the Japanese guy, uh, buyer and this is the guy who runs the wonderful organic nappery business in Japan, right? So, and I bet you that they're at the Tilpa property now and I bet you that this guy and these guys have been to that factory in Japan. Okay, so one of the reasons I like to tell this story, it's about the integration that happens with organic when people get in touch with their product and their market and where it goes to much greater extent than most growers would know about who buys their product, what their expectations are, and I say this is a great yarn to tell about organic production. And with that, I'm ready to stop. Thank you.